We flew to Ho Chi Minh City, formerly called Saigon. We were there for two weeks, four or five days in each one. It took a half a day trip to the Mekong Delta and the Chu Chi Tunnels, which we'll talk about later. Then we flew to Wei uh, and visited the demilitarized zone and the Citadel. And then we took an overnight train to Hanoi. We were there for three or four days each place and basically visited the, uh, the museums. This is obviously a map drawn in the U.S. because it puts North and South Vietnam as two separate countries, which is, a, which is another fiction. Vietnam was always one country historically, and uh, to justify the war, they pretended that North Vietnam was somehow a different country than South Vietnam, and it was never the case. Just a picture of Ho Chi Minh City from our hotel room. It's changing a lot and developing. More than 10 million people. Uh, this is uh, some housing, uh, typical housing in uh, any of the three cities, uh, just the way the construction is going. And this is a woman we met with our first day in uh, Ho Chi Minh City. There's, it's mostly uh, motorcycles, and it's a little strange. Every country has its own uh, culture of crossing streets. And she saw us. We were waiting to cross the street because all these all these motorcycles were going, and she crossed, and she came back and said, I thought you were coming with me. She came back and got us by the hand and crosses the street. People just cross streets, and somehow motorcycles don't stop, but they don't hit anybody, and it's just a, but it takes a little getting used to. So she was so wonderful, and she's the first person we met and had to take her picture. This is uh, what a lot of the streets look like in, Ho in all the cities. Uh, this is Ho Chi Minh City. A lot of motorcycles. Uh, not Harley Davidsons, but just sort of decent motorcycles, not a lot of beeping, and it's just a, a respectful culture. You don't hear a lot of beeping and cursing, like, uh, even though you don't have a lot of stoplights either. But uh, and then people are very friendly, love to have the picture taken. This is also Ho Chi Minh City, and uh, this is a man with his bike, and it's just such a cute picture, uh, having the dogs uh, navigate. A lot, almost all the people on the uh, motorcycles wear the, uh, uh, masks over their uh, face. And this was uh, at a coffee shop in Ho Chi Minh City and we had coffee there and, and uh, we asked uh, the young woman if we could take her picture so she said yes and then she walked away like somehow I was going to take a picture of the coffee machine. So we tracked her over and said we want to take your picture. He took her friends over and it's just a wonderful picture to see. Uh, they could be anywhere and this was in Vietnam. It was just great. And this was, these are four uh, young women we met at a park in Ho Chi Minh City, and they were canvassing the, pop, the people for uh, what they thought of Ho Chi Minh City and, and the traffic. And we told them how much we loved it, and they said, do you have any ideas on how to improve traffic? We said, well, maybe you stoplight it two more, but it was very friendly. It was just, because they, they really wanted to know what we thought, and they want to have the picture taken. And this is just a shop in Ho Chi Minh City. Uh, a lot goes on in the sidewalks, people eating, parking their motorcycles, and working, and this is right off the sidewalk of a, a tailor shop. And this is just another woman saying hello on the street. Well, here we are in front of Lenin. Uh, there aren't too many places where Leninists can have their pictures taken in front of a statue of Lenin. But, so I, I really put this in because we went as tourists. We, we weren't invited as uh, delegates, and we, we didn't speak to any cadre. Uh, we didn't speak to the government. But we felt that we, sh we could give a view of how the Vietnamese people view their great spring victory over U.S. imperialism uh, April 30th and the, the reuniting of their country because they've set up so many museums and historic sites that go over this and we visited a lot of them and our presentation is largely based on that. There, a lot of them are very big tourist attractions and there are a lot of tourists that go there and Vietnamese go there too and the children go there to learn their history. There's the um, Warm Remnants Museum in uh, Ho Chi Minh City that goes over uh, the whole history of the war against Vietnam, the French, and the U.S. That's the biggest tourist attraction in Vietnam. And, and the Coochie Tunnels, which will be, we will go into the second. Uh, there's a, a wonderful uh, Ho Chi Minh Museum in Hanoi, a women's museum, and it's all been reconfigured and geared towards the 40th anniversary on the 30th. Uh, a museum of the ethnic minority minorities, all these are very big tourist attractions. So this is what we base it on. 
And also when we got there, we found that everywhere there were signs and posters in all three cities and on the countryside that uh, were building up to the 30th. So this is one of them. Another one uh, on the left is the flag of the National Liberation Front. Uh, the other side of the 40 is the flag of Vietnam. And this is like a, a typical street in, in, in any of the cities that where there, there are these red banners up now for the, the celebration. And the banner uh, the, with the, the hammer and sickle, that's the, the banner of the party, the Vietnamese Workers' Party. And if it had a red star, it would be the banner of the nation. This was a uh, Holo prison uh, in, in Hanoi, and it, it shows the uh, repression, uh, resistance and repression under the French. Uh, this was a prison where people were treated horribly, conditions were inhumane. Uh, this picture is in the early 1900s, uh, in the 1930s, I think, and I, they're very proud of this, uh, the solidarity and uh, the, uh, that the prisoners had despite the horrific inhumane conditions uh, in stockades. Uh, they did political education, they found ways of resisting, showing solidarity, and uh, they explained very proudly that out of this prison came the leadership of the party. That's, that's where it came from, and it's just an amazing story to go to that prison. This is Ho Chi Minh in Versailles after the, uh, World War I. He came to Versailles to uh, represent Vietnam and uh, uh, he had heard of, of President, U.S. President Woodrow Wilson's promise of self-determination and uh, uh, but obviously that uh, didn't apply to the colonies. That uh, he, he confronted Woodrow Wilson asking for independence uh, for Vietnam out of the treaty and he was escorted out very unceremoniously. He's everywhere in, in Vietnam. And this is a, a ship that says, uh, this is a ship that he worked on. It says he got a job as kitchen help and went abroad to find a way to save the country. So this is a French ship he worked on for several years as a coal stoker and uh, or a dishwasher. And he, he never, he had such a strong multinational working class perspective. He was a founding member of the French Communist Party. And this is his party card in 1922. Uh, he, he, he was in, very involved in, in uh, international politics. He was a, a, co a contemporary of Lenin. This is a propaganda brigade from 1944 from the fight against the French. And it's very interesting because a propaganda in the Marxist sense of, of educating uh, the people was always a very important part of their struggle and uh, all over the place you see indications that they felt this was an important part of the victory. Every uh, military unit really from then on always had a propaganda uh, representative of the party as well as a military leader. By propaganda they meant raising the level of the party, ensuring that there was unity between the people and keeping the morale high and keeping people focused on the goals. Also the party did not just struggle from liberation. It saw itself, this is a peasant country, it saw itself right from the beginning as fighting imperialism and fighting feudalism. They had a peasant country, they would have a peasant army. So wherever they went, they liberated the land and redistributed among the peasants. And this is how they won the peasants over. Uh, this is uh, the, the defeat at, of the French at Dien Bien Phu in 1954. The People's Army, involving the whole population, uh, captured and defeated the French and, and over, over, overran the largest military um, base in the Indochina Peninsula and took 10,000 prisoners. But the struggle was not over because the U.S. moved. It had been funding this, this uh, the struggle, the, the French uh, occupation for a while, and they moved right in. We don't usually think of the U.S. occupation starting in 1954, but they do. They see it as 20 years of fighting the U.S. This is uh, the Ho Chi Minh mausoleum where, where his body is in state uh, and it's, um, it's an event. Going there is an event. It's a tourist event but it's a Vietnamese event and uh, it's always crowded and there are always lines there. 
And this is the, the Ho Chi Minh Museum right across the way. It's not just devoted to Ho Chi Minh the person, it's devoted to Vietnam. There's a lot of economic and political uh, information in it on uh, rice quotas and development. Uh, this is a statue when you come in. It's a giant, giant statue of Ho Chi Minh. See, there's a couple of kids posing right in front. Uh, it's a place to take pictures of your children. And this, this is a crowd that, and, and when we were there, this is a crowd that just came in and stopped to take pictures of the Ho Chi Minh statue. Uh, and this is another part of the museum where uh, Vietnamese pose and uh, that they're holding Uncle Ho's hand. Uh, this is a, a, a display in the museum showing what they were up against, the liberation forces. The puppet army, the U.S. Army had up to uh, an over half a million troops. Uh, the puppet army, they always call it the puppet army, which it was, grew to over a million. And uh, there were 50,000 from South Korea and smaller troops from Thailand, Australia, the Philippines, and New Zealand. So it was, uh, uh, this is what they were up against. This is a, uh, we just couldn't help but take this picture. This is a solidarity internationally uh, from many countries, but particularly from China and the Soviet Union. Uh, most of the aid, I think, came from the Soviet Union, which was in a position to give the most aid. But this is a picture uh, of a rally uh, in China during the Cultural Revolution in solidarity with Vietnam. You can see uh, uh, Mao Zedong there. It's just one of those humongous rallies they used to have in solidarity. This is... This is a picture of our own comrades that we found in one of the museums. Uh, at the left is, uh, let me just point them out for people who don't know. This is Comrade Dottie Ballin, who's a founder of the party. Over here, here are holding the U.S. Uh, troops out of Vietnam, Youth Against War and Fascism. It's Deirdre. If you look closely, you can see her. Uh, she told me. I, I didn't. There you are, Deirdre. <laughs> and over here is Marianne Weissman was also a comrade at the time. And, and let me just point out this sign, Vietnam and Harlem, wars against the working people. Our, our anti-war demonstrations were always characterized by stop the war against uh, Vietnam, stop the war against black America. We always connected these struggles. And that's what won many of us over here during the period. This was another picture uh, that was related to us. The sign, the Treaty Coalition, I, I think was the, uh, uh, Paul remembered, it was really the first uh, major coalition of broad forces that Youth Against War and Fascism pulled together. This picture was in several museums. And it says, Nixon, you lied, stop the bombing, sign the treaty. That was our chant. And it was at a time when it was very clear that the Vietnamese had already won, that there was no way that the U.S. was going to win this war. But the U.S. responded, and we'll talk about this more, with this massive bombing and, um, and defoliation of the whole country to do as much damage as possible. And the Vietnamese wanted the U.S. to sign a treaty, and there were ultra-left forces here who felt that somehow the, the Vietnamese were selling out, uh, you know, uh, and, and we organized this coalition. It was a very important coalition. It was a good contribution. We would like to thank the communist parties and working class of the countries in the world, national liberation movement, nationalist countries, peace-loving countries, international democratic organizations, and progressive human beings for their wholehearted support and strong encouragement to our people's patriotic resistance against the U.S. for national salvation. This was a statement uh, from uh, the Vietnamese Communist Party. This is the uh, introduction to the uh, Chu Chi Tunnels, which are world famous, and uh, they were about 40 miles north of uh, what was then Saigon during the war. Uh, the tunnels uh, began uh, on the resistance to the French, and it became a complex of over 150 miles. Uh, there was several floors down. They had uh, underground villages, in effect, living quarters, kitchens, weapons factories, hospitals, bomb shelters, uh, music halls. It was a very, very tough life. But uh, it was, went on for many years. The, the Tet Offensive began, uh, it was uh, towards Saigon, began from the Kuchi Tunnels, which were built and started from the peasant population in the area. It was always a, a, a radical area from the... Uh, uh, land reform. But you, you go to the Tucci Tunnels, over a million people a year visit the Coochie Tunnels, both from Vietnam, from Asia, from Europe, Australia, and it's just uh, great to see such a uh, tourist attraction. It's a number two tourist attraction in Vietnam.
Uh, this is a, uh, just a picture of guerrilla fighters. Uh, very strong uh, tradition of women fighters uh, going way back, and uh, they were a, a very crucial uh, and large part of the resistance. This is one of the entrances to the tunnels, and this is one of the uh, tourists uh, admiring the tunnels. Uh, it's just great to see people could see what the resistance went to. It was very hard to live in the tunnels. There were uh, uh, danger from malaria, from scorpions, snakes. It was a very hard existence, but uh, it was a harder existence for the, some of the soldiers, uh, uh, imperialist soldiers, trying to go there because uh, there were all kinds of traps and uh, false leads, and it was just a, 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 a miracle, of, uh, not a miracle, but a great in ingenuity to do these tunnels. Uh, this is uh, one of the uh, imperialist tanks that was destroyed at the Chuchi tunnels, and it's, it became a very popular place for People had their pictures taken, and uh, it was a pleasure to see. It's great. This is uh, our guide pointing out the, uh, that was a ventilation hole for the Coochie Tunnel. So you can imagine what life was like in the tunnels with such a small ventilation hole. They were generally hidden, and there were a lot of them, but that, it, it's very difficult. Uh, it just shows the dedication, uh, you, you know, what army could do that. The, the South Vietnamese army wouldn't generally go near the tunnels because they were so dangerous. <laughs> and uh, this is tourists going into the tunnels. Some of the tunnels were enlarged, so tourists could go in and and appreciate. And there were guides there, and it's just uh, it's just great to see what an anti-war monument it was. And people were just uh, overwhelmed with the resistance. These are some of the traps that were built in the tunnels, and and others outside as booby traps, uh, and. Uh, it was the ingenuity of the local population that uh, used, utilized what they, they did to trap animals. And here was uh, bamboo sticks sharpened into points and covered with animal manure, which would cause infection. So if you stepped into that, you, you were in big trouble. You couldn't get out and you had an infection. And if you, you crawled into a tunnel and you got stuck in that, you were not getting out. Now, these are the people who sharpen the sticks. As we said, it was a people's war. Everyone was involved. Uh, this is another trap that one of the, uh, the guides dressed as a, a NLF fighter is showing us. And this is what happened if you fell in there. Uh, and this, this is another trap that if, if you were a GI and you broke down somebody's door, this is what hit you. Uh, there were bomb factories in the tunnels. Now, the Vietnamese said that everything that the U.S. left, they used against them. And they took these bombs that weren't exploded, they were very dangerous, they defused them, and they used the gunpowder to make mines and grenades. And it was the mines that they made from the U.S. weapons that took out that tank. These are the, the Ho Chi Minh sandals that the military wore, once again using everything that the U.S. left, made from U.S. tires, and they had a little manufactory there. You could buy them. <laughs> this is, uh, you know, it, was, it, was, it was a political struggle always, and this is a sign that was left for GIs. GIs opposed the U.S. aggressive war in South Vietnam, and I know there were many other uh, signs that were aimed towards the black GIs, pointing out what a racist society they're from and, and why fight for it. But this was one we found. Um, this is one of the many heroes of the Coochie Tunnels. This is Tran Thai Gong who in 1966 was given the title Valiant Soldier in Wiping Out the U.S. Infantry. This is the, uh, one of the entrances of the Citadel at Way. Uh, Way had great significance for Vietnam. It was uh, built, the Citadel was built in 1802 by the emperor then, and it really represented the unity of Vietnam. It's in the, it's the center of Vietnam, and it was uh, actually sacked by the French uh, later on in the 1800s uh, as a uh, uh, retaliation for resistance. Uh, it had, uh, it was a scene of very, very heavy fighting during the Tet Offensive and suffered great damage from bombing. Uh, it's interesting that th this was the site of where the emperor was and that there was a, a plaque and they're explaining that the, the uh, the, uh, that Ho Chi Minh summoned the emperor to his office and told him that he was no longer emperor and that's kind of what ended the emperor in, in Vietnam. Uh, but the, it was uh, wonderful to visit the, the uh, to know what the significance of the Citadel at Way was, that it represented the unity of Vietnam. 
Now we're in the DMZ, the demilitarized zone. Uh, this is at the 17th parallel, which is where the imperialists artificially divided Vietnam. Uh, and it, it, there was a, it was a six mile stretch uh, around uh, on either side. Uh, and it was like the front lines uh, between North and South. It was a, the site of the, the most fighting, and the US had a huge number of bases string, strung along here. This was called the Rock. And it was the, the, the site of the, the major U.S. observation point for the whole area. They, they, um, they airlifted, I think, 12 GIs with a lot of heavy equipment up there, and they could see everything that went on. And it didn't look like this. It was defoliated. This is 40 years later and a lot of effort later. But uh, parts of this place look like a moonscape. Uh, and uh, one, one, of the, the, one of the reasons why it was important strategically to the U.S., and of course, to the Vietnamese people, was that it was uh, where the Ho Chi Minh Trail came out of Laos and came back in, into Vietnam. Let me, let me. The Ho Chi Minh Trail was a very important supply route between the, the North and, and the South that made the fighting possible. Supplies, food, troops, equipment, and it was a, a extremely rough terrain. Uh, and uh, it came. Th this is the way it came. It's a, Vietnam is a long, skinny country. If the, if the U.S. set up a barricade over here, it could stop almost everything. Not so. Uh, with the help of the revolutions and revolutionaries in Laos and Cambodia, the trail came, here's the DMZ, came this way and then back into Vietnam through Laos and through Cambodia. This is a site where the trail was. This is the, the Doc Ron Bridge forging the Kamlo River. Uh, the, the name may mean some, something to some of the GIs, uh, but it was a very strategic spot that was bombed again and again and again. It's about six miles away from the border of Laos, so, so the supplies are coming either over that bridge, where the bridge was bombed out, the, 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 uh, the trail would go right through the river. They never stopped the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Here's what it was like, and this is the technology level. But it was the will of the people that made it happen. And a guy told us that in this area, and in a lot of areas, the trail was maintained by local women. And this is another one. That, 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 set, that picture, which is generally famous, is on its side. And this is uh, an actual bike and materials that came over the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Vietnam, uh, about 80% of Vietnam is Viet people, and the other 20% are 53 uh, ethnic minorities. And, and uh, much uh, uh, attention, care, recognition is given to the minorities. And this is a plaque honoring them that's in another museum that, that was in uh, Ho Chi Minh City. But we, we visited a village of one of the minorities right there in the DMC, and, and this is a historic picture, and we put it here because the, this pe these people uh, that we visited, um, that the Pau people were the ones who, uh, in, in the early days of the U.S. occupation, shot bows and arrows at U.S. planes. A U.S. plane gave back, and it had an arrow in it. And people on the left here noted that and thought, this is not going to be a show in for the U.S. And it gave, it gave heart to the Vietnamese people as well. So these, we, we went to a village, and, and uh, these are the uh, descendants of, of, of some of these very same people. We met the youth as they were coming out of school. They have um, a brand new eco-tourist center. They're looking to develop eco-tourism. Uh, but lo look at this. This is in front of their school. And it's a sign cautioning the students to stay away from unexploded ordnance. Quantry, which is a little larger than Rhode Island, is the most bombed piece of Earth in history. The Pentagon dropped more tonnage of explosives than they dropped in Germany in all of World War II. Some 20% of the weapons did not detonate. Quang Tri is the only province where students have to study textbooks on mine identification and prevention in order to be safe. Since 1975, over 7,000 people in Quang Tri have been killed and many thousands seriously maimed, loss of limb, blindness, or both from accidentally coming upon U.S. bombs still alive and dangerous in Vietnam. Throughout the country, 100,000 people have either died or been seriously maimed since the end of the war. So the U.S. war continues. 
Defoliation. The U.S. sprayed 20 million gallons of concentrated herbicides. Quang Tri was one of the most heavily defoliated areas. Much of the province looked like this. We were glad to see that most of it was green, and as you can see in the other pictures. But our guide explained that the reforestation was accomplished and erosion stopped by planting fast-growing eucalyptus trees, which are often cut for timber. Now that's good, but it's not the three, the three canopy rainforests that existed before with a diverse animal population and medicinal herbs that rival the Amazon, but at least there's no erosion and, and, and it looks certainly much better. It's just an indication of the damage the U.S. did. In some areas of Kwangtri, the ecology was so disrupted that reforestation was not possible and only scrub grows. Uh, this invasive grass on land made barren by defoliants is called, called American grass by the Vietnamese. Uh, this is a family uh, where um, uh, th their children are very seriously disabled uh, from Agent Orange and Dioxin. Defoliants containing Agent Orange with Dioxin, the most poisonous substance in the world, and Vietnam has the largest uh, con um, contamination of dioxin in the world. Uh, Three million people are affected and 4.8 million people were exposed. 22% uh, of the families have three or more victims. Uh, it's not just in Quang Tri, it's all over Vietnam because now it's gone down through three generations because it's changed genetic makeup. And sometimes it skips a generation, which it, it probably did with mom, and it went to the children. And it, what, what you have is um, uh, there are some villages uh, there's a cluster in Quang Tri where the, the, the planes went over uh, that uh, are known as the Asian Oran villages. And may, many families have two or more children with birth defects. And uh, it's a peasant culture, so children are very important to survive, to, uh, you know, have your own survival. So people had a child who was very disabled, and it didn't make sense to them, so they had another. And that one was very, very disabled. And it, it was an unfolding process to really realize what was going on. And it's also a big drain on, on the Vietnamese economy to, to be able to find the resources. Uh, this is another uh, man who's a victim of Agent Orange and Neurological with his son. It, his, it skipped a generation and his son is okay here. Veterans also suffer from Agent Orange and after a, a, a struggle receive compensation. This, this is a child of a veteran where it skipped a generation and she's missing an arm. Uh, so it's here too. Um, but the, the U.S. compensated, after a big struggle, the U.S. compensated veterans here, but it never it refuses to compensate Vietnam for this, and it also refuses to, to pay to, to get those bombs out, uh, which is a, a humongous job. They, they're, uh, the, the DMZ may be the most extreme, but they're all over. What we came in contact was these uh, workshops for disabled people uh, uh, that they produce uh, produce artwork and it, the tourists all have all come through these and you're expected to, to buy an artwork or, or make a contribution even though the US did so much damage uh, in the DMZ and in Quang Tri they never could stop the Ho Chi Minh Trail and they never could stop the the, uh, the liberation forces in fact uh, the, the U.S. Uh, military command had a call, the Ho Chi Minh Trail, the greatest en en engineering feat of the 20th century. And, and this is uh, over here on the left. It's a diorama from a museum that's at uh, Khe Sanh. Some of the vets may know Khe Sanh and the battles of Khe Sanh. This is in Khe Sanh. Khe Sanh is now um, a museum. And uh, it was, uh, uh, they flattened the mountaintop to put it there. It was a high base, it was sort of invincible, but it was over, it was besieged and overrun. And uh, this is now, uh, on, on the left of the diorama, there's like a, a sensor. Uh, these are one of the things that the U.S. dropped on the Ho Chi Minh Trail in order to pick up one that was being used to bomb it. And the Vietnamese foiled that by tying pigs to the tree or putting chickens there. Next. And here's uh, the U.S. troops scrambling to get on a plane to be airlifted out. And this, uh, this became very famous at the time. 
caution, being a marine and, and, and caisson may be hazardous to your health. This is a tip of a rice field uh, in, in Vietnam, flooded uh, rice field. Vietnam is a, a very big rice producing country. I think it's uh, still over 70 percent agricultural. But the damage from the bombing, the defoliation, the biological warfare was so great. Vietnam was forced to import rice until 1988 to prevent starvation in the country. And this is a, one of the largest rice producing countries in the world. Uh, the damage was so great. Uh, I remember uh, hearing during the war, uh, the puppet government imported rice from Louisiana. But the damage to the uh, ecology was so great. Uh, that just shows how difficult it was for Vietnam to uh, recover from the war. That even 13 years after the war, they still couldn't even produce enough rice. And then after that, they were able to export rice to develop the country. But it took a long time uh, to get to that point. This is General Jap. <laughs> Great hero of Vietnam and the architect of the victory over uh, French imperialism and U.S. imperialism, which is called the American War in Vietnam. And this is, a, 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 his picture's all over also. And this is a great quote. It says, a general, despite his great work, is just a drop in the ocean. You call me a legendary general, but I thought I'm no different from our soldiers. So that's the kind of leader that wins liberation struggles. Uh, just a, a great quote. And this is, we were at the, uh, uh, the Ho Chi Minh uh, Mausoleum, which the, they said, come early because it's so crowded. And we were very fortunate to meet a number of uh, veterans of the war uh, with the medals. They were also heroes and proud. It was so great to see them. And this was a, a group of veterans led by disabled veterans, Viet, uh, uh, veterans of the liberation struggle uh, outside the Ho Chi Minh mausoleum. And this is another picture of, of them. It's so great to see them. It was a, just to meet them was the highlight of the trip. And this, this guy we met in Ho Chi Minh City, he was a veteran. And he, uh, I asked to take his picture. He said, yeah. And then he stood up and shook my hand. And, and it was just great. And I, I didn't want to wash my hand for a long time. But I eventually had to. But it was just such a thrill to meet him. What a great picture. What a great smile. This is the... Uh, uh, the Puppet Army in Retreat is a very famous picture throughout Vietnam, and it kind of highlights the, uh, uh, the approach of the South Vietnamese Puppet Army once the U.S. left and the bombing stopped. This was their retreat, I think, in the Central Highlands uh, in 1975 uh, when the uh, Liberation Forces uh, won their victory. So they, they didn't even keep their boots on. And this is an army of a million people, a million soldiers. This is a presidential palace, but be, before uh, I, I wanted to mention um, Curtis LeMay's uh, quote, he was the head of the, the Strategic Air Command, and he said his solution to Vietnam was to bone, b bomb it into the Stone Age. And, and they really tried to do that uh, when it was very clear they weren't going to win the war. Um, okay, but the, the March to Liberation ended up um, on uh, April 30th at the Presidential Palace. This is the Presidential Palace. It's nice to see red flags in front of the Presidential Palace. And, and this is the iconic picture of the tanks coming through the gate. And here's Paul at the gate. Um, and uh, this was the first tank to come in, tank uh, 390. And this tank was donated by China. And this is a second tank to come in, uh, 843, and this tank was donated by the Soviet Union. This is part of the museum at, at the Presidential Palace, and they're very conscious of where their support came from. And they, they, this, the Sino-Soviet split was on at the time, and, and uh, the Vietnamese, the, more than anybody, if anybody could keep, keep them together, at least for a while, the Vietnamese could do it. And uh, this is preparation for the, uh, the April 30th ceremonies. And uh, here's a tank for, for the children. And people know their tanks. They know their numbers. They know the, their history. And they know what came in first. Uh, this is um, uh, a, a podium set up at the palace for, for the celebrations. Uh, and, and this is the, the actual day of the celebration. Uh, this is uh, President uh, Tang Dong. 
Prime Minister. Uh, thanks to Johnny Stevens, who found me the URL to get his talk. And I, I just want to uh, give you a feel for some of the things he said. Uh, he thanked all the people of Vietnam for the 1975 victory. He also thanked the, peop the people of the socialist countries, especially the Soviet Union and China, all progressive governments, organizations, and individuals around the world who supported their struggle, and praised the alliance of the three people, the Vietnamese, the Cambodians, and, and the Laotians in fighting shoulder to shoulder. He said the U.S. committed countless barbarous crimes, causing immeasurable loss and pain to our people of country. He, he gave an economic update. He talked about 30 years of reform, going from an underdeveloped nation to a middle, what he called a middle-income developing country, with an average annual growth rate of 7%, a per capita income of $2,200. Um, industries and services are 83% of the gross national product, and more than 98% of the households have electricity. They're still electrifying the countryside. Uh, now. Uh, we were. We also saw information saying that the country is about 30% urban and about 70% rural right now. Uh, he talked about the weaknesses that had to be overcome. He talked about a, a gap that has grown between rich and poor, uh, that they haven't been able to develop the country as quickly as they possible. He said that uh, the party needs to do a better job to meet the social and cultural needs of the people, and the party needs to raise its its theoretical level. So it was a frank talk. He mentioned that they were trying to develop a socialist-oriented market economy. That's how he put it, his words. They, they need to uh, make some retreats to develop the country. I, I think, it made me think, reading the talk, that I think in a capitalist country, the government answers to the capitalists. In a country like Vietnam, the capitalists answer to the government. I think that's a, a sum that they're bringing in. They have to develop the country by making some retreats, but uh, the party is very much in charge, and it's very clear throughout the country that it's a party that won liberation, and uh, they're running the country. He said that they're looking to build a society where their children will have the technical stills to rebuild and fully develop the country. And I thought it would be relevant to look at the situation for children under the U.S. occupation and the, the situation right now. And this was, here's a child that in the, in the midst of a defoliated area. And uh, here, here's a, a family cowering before uh, a USGI, very reminiscent of the, the Milai massacre, where 500 mostly women and children, uh, in, ranging from infants to people in their 80s, uh, were murdered by U.S. troops. Uh, and a recent book, Kill anything that moves has documented other massacres. We, the, the, the party always knew that this was just one, and they utilized the, the massacre to hide the others. But this was uh, done at when, when the U.S. was was counting bodies. They they really were losing the war, and the way they talked about winning the war was counting bodies. The body count for today. This is the this is the body count that they really did. And, they, and here's another situation. Uh, uh, for children under the U.S. occupation. This, I, I think most people have seen this picture. And I think it says a lot. It was called the War of Terror and, and was considered one of the most significant pictures of the 20th century. These children are running from being napalmed. Um, and uh, the, the nine-year-old girl who was taking all her clothes off because uh, they burned, her back was burned. This is uh, Pham T. Kim Fu. Uh, she had 17 operations. Uh, she grew to, uh, she studied in Cuba, and eventually she, she moved to, uh, to Canada. So uh, to use this picture, I think it's important to, to talk about that she was okay and she, she was taken care of. But this is the legacy of, of the U.S. occupation for the children. And then this is what this is where it's at for the children of Vietnam. They come to the War Remnants Museum, and and the only U.S. ordinance they see is what's been captured and stands as a relic to teach them their history. Yeah, it was so exciting to go to the War Remnants Museum. It used to be called the War Crimes Museum, and, and see uh, uh, children from elementary schools coming to see their history and to. Uh, uh, see what, what's happening. And they were so friendly and receptive. 
had the picture taken. We took a lot of pictures, and the teachers were there had their pictures taken. It was just uh, one of the many highlights of the trip. And this was the uh, Ho Chi uh, in Ho Chi Minh City, one of the parks that we happened along. Uh, this was really the highlight of the trip to see these uh, youth practicing for this 40th anniversary celebration. That's that's 40. The, the standing in front of it, and they were so friendly and just uh, uh, loved to have the picture taken and to share uh, to share their victory. Really, there's some more pictures of the youth in the park. Uh, it, it totally made our day and made our trip to see these. And these are some kids practicing uh, for the celebration. And this is some more. Just everywhere we went, it was just so wonderful to see. And uh, more scouts. And I fell in love with this kid. I mean, it's like great to have a celebration, but you know, my ice cream is important. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it was very cool. Uh, it was a joy seeing how healthy and self-confident they looked, and it was clear that they would and could bring to fruition Ho Chi Minh's prediction about Vietnam. Our mountains will always be here, our rivers will always be, our people will always be. The American invaders defeated, we will build our land ten times more beautiful. <laughs>